Meanwhile, humans can exercise and cool down at the same time. And that's the trick of sweating. And it's only because we have so much surface area. So when that antelope shoots off, we run after it, it stops to cool down, we catch up with it, forcing it to run again and again and again. Meanwhile, we're staying cool-ish um, by sweating and ultimately eat, it either dies of heat stroke or becomes so weakened that it's easy to kill. And so this is really how come humans are able to survive most climates on Earth and why we've dominated this planet. I would love to start at the beginning with how you got interested in the subject of sweat and perspiration. There's a lot I want to get into about the the subject itself, but for you personally, what is the background story on your own personal interest in the subject? Yeah, well, I like to exercise a lot, um, <laughs> and I'm a person who's also really sweaty. Uh, so I kind of always have felt a little bit mortified by my sweat. So, you know, at any spin class or any yoga class, I am the first person to start dripping on the mat, um, even in the warm up. And mm -hmm. so instead of like focusing on my downward dog and being Zen, I'm like looking around to see if I'm the only one who's sweating. So, like, I always felt a little bit insecure about how quickly and how much I sweat, although I was only really sweating, you know, when I was doing exercise. But I'm also a science journalist. So I had spoken to a lot of evolutionary biologists, and I knew that sweating was actually a human superpower, that evolutionary biologists consider it one of the things that makes us unique in the animal kingdom, along with being the naked ape and having big brains. And so I figured I needed to dig in a little bit deeper to rectify um, this disconnect between this thing that supposedly makes us amazing as animals and this thing that we kind of all are a little bit mortified by, or many of us. I would classify myself in that category of people who are mortified by my own capacity to sweat. So I, I sympathize. Um, you go into detail in your book about the fact that sweating really is a, a superpower, or at least has been a superpower for humans in our evolutionary history. And I would love to give you some time to really uh, give some detail about why that is, what we know about the importance and the role of sweat in our own history. Yeah, sure. Well, sweating ultimately is there to regulate our body temperature because if we go too high, we can die of heat stroke. And death by heat stroke is a terrible way to die. Like Google it, it's very bad. Mm. Bad things happen. Um, and so, you know, we all, all animals need to find ways to cool down. And as it turns out, humans evolved the most efficient way in the entire animal kingdom um, for doing that. And it's part and parcel with being the naked ape. So what happens when our body temperature rises is that we begin to sweat, right? Two to five million sweat glands on every human body. So the pores open, liquid comes out, and our body heat evaporates that liquid away. And that chemical process consumes heat. So effectively, your sweat's evaporation is whisking the body heat from your body up and away into the atmosphere. And as you can imagine, having a non-furry, non-hairy surface is an optimal way of doing that, right? So if you think about other animals, such as a dog, they evaporate their body heat off of the only naked part of their body, which is their tongue right? Mm. That is not a lot of surface area. Even our closest evolutionary neighbors, the chimpanzees, they pant to cool off. Instead, we use our entire surface area. And as a result, we can withstand a lot of really warm temperatures. When it's cold, we wear the fur of other animals. And when it's hot, not only uh, can we handle the heat very well, better than most other animals, but we can also exercise in the heat. And this is really important for human evolution. Hmm. Because as you can imagine, in the early days of you know humanity on the savannah, uh, all of our prey and most of our predators run faster than we do. Hmm. And so you know, how do you hunt? How do you escape? Well, in terms of hunting, think about um, an antelope, right? Well, it can definitely sprint faster than humans, but it ultimately 
needs to stop and cool down by panting, usually, so that it doesn't die of heat stroke. Meanwhile, humans can exercise and cool down at the same time. And that's the trick of sweating. And it's only because we have so much surface area. So when that antelope shoots off, we run after it, it stops to cool down, we catch up with it, forcing it to run again and again and again. Meanwhile, we're staying cool-ish um, by sweating and ultimately it e- e- either dies of heat stroke or becomes so weakened that it's easy to kill. And so this is really how come humans are able to survive most climates on Earth and why we've dominated this planet, I mean, for better or for worse. Hmm. I feel like that is such an underappreciated component of what it means to be human and an underappreciated fact of our rise to the top of the food chain. Um, You gave some detail just now about how that process typically worked. And I wonder if it might make sense to pause and just have you re-articulate in any more detail you might like to give about how that process worked for how we hunted game historically, where everyone knows, like you just said, that the big game uh, on the savannah are all more physically it seemingly capable than people are, but well, they can sprint it, faster. They can sprint faster, and so the 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 length of time that it typically takes to, for example, with an antelope or some other big game, what's the what's the story about how that typically? Because I know there are still hunter gatherers around now that I'm sure are in, uh, implementing this strategy. How exactly does that story typically unfold with how we're able to successfully hunt? Well, I mean, we can still run marathons these days, mm. right? Humans, even in you know modern society, can run for hours. The fastest of us can run, you know, a marathon in two hours straight. Mm. Others take four or five, six hours of continuous running. Whereas, you know, a, an animal must sprint away very quickly to get away from us, but it can't maintain that sprint for long because if it does, its body heat will rise, and if that happens, every cell in its body starts to effectively melt and all sorts of bad things happen with heat stroke. So for example, um, your digestive tract, the the like membrane becomes weak and all the bacteria in your gut start to invade your body. You have seizures, vomiting is involved. It's really a terrible way to die. And so all of us constantly, uh, all, all animals, mammals specifically, are trying to keep your body temperature, their body temperature in a very fixed area, right? Like in a very small window. And so actually right now, I don't appear to be sweating, but I am. Mm. I am sure you are sweating because (laughs) our body's making these micro adjustments to our body temperature. And we only notice the sweat, the wetness when we really exercise a lot. And that's because um, our body is like, oh crap. Um, We're not just doing a little bit of of, of exercise. We're really going, going wild. So your your body gets cracking and make sure there's enough liquid on the surface of your skin so that all of it can evaporate away. And that evaporation process is actually a lot like making a reduction, as they would say in foodie world, right? So effectively, in order to make liquid go away when you're making a reduction, you need heat right? And so your body heat is actually providing the energy for the water molecules on your skin to evaporate up into the atmosphere. And so it's consuming the heat in your body. And for humans in particular, when we start to exercise heavily or go into a hot sauna, um, for many of us who are lighter skinned, the first thing that you notice is that your face turns red, Mm. right? And that's because all of your veins are pushing up against the skin. That's got two goals. The first goal is that all the hot blood in your interior is coming to the surface of your skin so that it can be cooled off by the sweat evaporation. Right. And then the other reason that you turn red is because those sweat glands, they need to source something. And so you don't just have little bags of water um, next to all of those sweat glands. Sweat glands source that liquid from your blood. That's why it's often uh, really important to rehydrate after you've sweat a lot, because otherwise your blood will get thick, right? You are losing water from your circulatory system. So that is why. 
you turn red. Um, mm. And also that's why it is such an efficient way of cooling down. Because if you think about the entire human body compared to say what a dog uses, right? That is just this very tiny tongue. I mean, dog tongues seem pretty large and kind of gross and slobbery, but that is that tiny surface area is cooling down the entire beast, some of which are, you know, almost as big as small humans, right? Um, and other animals use this thing called evaporative cooling. That's the like scientific term for using the evaporation of water to cool down the body. Mm. And so we're using sweat, which is its own bodily fluid. Animals like chimpanzees and dogs are using saliva, but other animals use literally any other bodily fluid that they have available. So um, seals will pee on themselves to evaporate away urine. Um, some birds, like vultures, will poop on their own legs, right? Because bird poop's kind of liquidy. Um, bumblebees will vomit on themselves. And so when you think about how evolution could have bequeathed us a cooling down strategy, mm. sweat may seem gross at times, but in comparison to the rest of the animal kingdom, we're doing pretty good, right? Can you imagine being on a subway and, you know, having all the other bodily fluids being used to, to cool everybody down? Yeah, that would make living in New York even slightly more horrifying. Yeah, uh, the th that's fascinating stuff, and the 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 history of our ability to track down successfully track down prey. Do you, I'm curious in your research if if you uncovered any information as to how far typically an antelope, for example, or other other animals that humans have historically hunted, are able to sprint away before they need to rest. And what that math kind of looks like, is it they run a mile and they need to rest for five minutes. And so there's enough time for us to catch up. Any yeah. idea about how that typically works? Oh, like the exact math? I think it would be really dependent on the runner mm. um, and on the species at hand. But it is like, you know, on the order of they can sprint for minutes mm. and we can run for hours, right? So if they are sprinting extremely fast, then we can catch up relatively soon, but not soon enough for them to completely cool down, right? So it's this, we're pushing them past um, their ability to, to, to stay cool um, and effectively pushing them into heat exhaustion, making it easy for them to be killed or just actually literally killing them. Yeah, fair enough. The, uh, you know, a question I have just always wondered about different people, and I, I think I mentioned this to you before we started talking that there's no question in my mind in my own family, I, I sweat am in the most sensitive to heat of anyone in my immediate nuclear family. What do we know or what did you discover? What do you know about um, why it is that certain people, and I, I think you gave uh, a range earlier, something between two and five million, um, why it is that certain people seem to be more uh, prone to being able to sweat more easily than others. Is there an evolutionary reason that you uncovered as to why that would be the case for certain humans? Yeah. So um, like a lot of things, it's a mix of nature, nurture, and choices. Hmm. Um, so in terms of like the nature side, uh, you are born um, genetically, right, with uh, a certain number of sweat glands. Also, it's not just the number of sweat glands that you have, it's the rate of the sweat coming out. So some people's mm. sweat glands um, really just drib, drib and mm. drab, and others, it's like a big flood. <laughs> and um, there's quite a large range um, uh, in humans. And, you know, you can think about it this way. If all the humans in the entire world stepped into a sauna right now um, and got sweating at their max, and if we were all about average sweaters, it would be like the floods over Niagara Falls on a summer's day, right? That's all the humans in the world sweating at full on. Anyway, so, but I digress. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you Genetics is like a really important part, right? So it's like how many sweat glands you have and how fast um, they can flood your skin with liquid. Then there's another kind of... Um, environmental factor, what we would call nurture. Mm -hmm. So when you're born, 
although you have sweat glands all over your body, they don't all become active until your toddler years. And so your body has a couple of years in there Mm. to figure out what kind of climate you're living in, right? So I'm sure you've had the experience of um, going to a really hot climate and all the locals seem to be like not sweating at all, right? And you're just like pouring down because you've come from a northern climb. That's because their bodies are really attuned to that climate. Because if you think about it, um, although uh, it's great to cool down, if you sweat too much so that you're dripping, Mm. you are not being very efficient with water, which is a scarce resource. And over human history has also been a scarce resource, right? So you want to be optimal. And those first few years of your life, your body is learning where you are like where you're living and, you know, how to be optimal about it. Because, you know, for most of human history, we didn't go very far away from, you know, Mm. the place that we were born. Mm. Okay. So, so there's a mix of nature and nurture, um, both of which you can blame on your parents um, (laughs) because they presumably were in control of your genes and also where you were in your toddler years. But there is this other thing that I mentioned called choices, right? So you can teach your body to um, sweat more. (laughs) So sweating, because it's so important for cooling down, right? A lot of athletes want to sweat more when they know that they have to compete in a place that is more hot and humid than perhaps the place where they normally train and live. Right. And so, for example, in front of the, or just before the Tokyo Olympics, which was like in a very hot, humid place, Um, athletes were were training to sweat more and sweat faster because if their body's freaking out about being overheated, it's not going to be as efficient in, you know, its its delivery of whatever athletic feat that person needs to do. Mm -hmm. And so you also talk to people who work in saunas or people who exercise a lot. And the more you exercise, the more you are likely to sweat sooner and faster. And if you, you know, work in a sauna most of the time and, and and there's people who do sauna dancing. It's like mm. a pretty funny little world of, of, that I discovered. Um, you effectively start sweating the moment you walk into the hot place instead of it being a gradual on-ramp because your body has been trained that, holy crap, when Sarah goes you know, hard, she goes really hard. Mm. And so you can kind of adjust. You can make these kind of micro adjustments to train your body to sweat sooner and sweat faster. But mostly you are working within a range that is biologically determined by your genetics and by those first few years of your life. Hmm. And when you say growing up in a certain environment, is that, you know, roughly speaking, the ages from birth to 10 that, you know, to toddler, to To toddler. toddler. So like two or three. And that that is that an epigenetic phenomenon where you are your body is basically acclimating to where you are and adjusting your genes accordingly so that you adapt better adapt to your environment? Yeah, so I would probably speculate that that is the case, but uh, scientists haven't yet made the like epigenetic uh, connection. But yes, that would make sense because effectively your sweat glands, right? They get uh, you know messages to turn on, turn off flood, don't flood, right? And so I would imagine that there's ways to make those genes turn on faster or or slower. I would assume it's epigenetic, but that science has not been done that I know of yet. Yeah, fair enough. And I think you just may have answered this, but the, and, and I'm sure it's complicated, but generally speaking, is it the case that people, I mean, I think you mentioned this a bit ago that, um, There's, I've always had, especially in the summertime, a rather extreme embarrassment about showing up to parties outside and just dumping sweat all over strangers that I've never met before. I'm here. Uh, (laughs) And it's, it's one of the more embarrassing, but expected social, uh, experiences that I have between the months of July and September. Um, but overall, is it your belief that that it's actually a signal of health to be able to turn on that ability to cool your body so quickly or or is it more complicated than that yeah i mean 
of course, there's complications, but honestly, we all need a perspiration pep talk. Like sweat is keeping us all alive. Thank you very much. Um, Certainly there are situations where illnesses can make you sweat more. A couple of examples, uh, folks who have a seizure, um, there are some medications that make you sweat more. There was in the like um, Middle Ages a sweating epidemic. They called it the English sweaty, um, mm. and people would like start sweating and then die very quickly within days. So, so yes, there are some you know actual conditions where. Um, yeah, sweating is not healthy. There's also a couple of conditions where um, folks really, really sweat a lot. That um, is uh, uh, a clinical condition, and effectively, about one, you know, about 15 million Americans mm. have this. Um, it's called hyperhidrosis, mm. and this is a level of sweating that is quite off the charts. So um, you sometimes have a problem holding a pencil because your hands are so sweaty that um, it just falls out. So, you know, you, you drop your, your cell phone or holding a piece of paper, it will dissolve in your hands. And, and that is a condition and um, it's most likely related to the autonomic nervous system. Like the, the signals are, are to like cool down or to close or that you are cooled down enough. Like they get messed up. There's, on the other hand, um, some conditions where people are born without sweat glands, and it's a genetic mm-hmm. condition. And for those folks, that's a very dangerous situation because they can very easily die of heat stroke. They can't go to warm places. They're constantly walking around with a little um, spritz bottle to literally s- put sweat on their bodies to evaporate their heat mm-hmm. away. So in most cases, though, um, sweating is super healthy, right? Mm-hmm. In It is keeping all of us alive. We just have this like really funny um, anxiety and taboo about it that um, is also partly related to something that I think is um, kind of a fundamental human trait. Hold on with me for a second. So we love to be in control. Um, most of the bodily functions that we have that are slightly mortifying, we have a minute amount of control over, like think burp or Mm. fart, or, you know, if you have to pee, right? Mm. Like you can control that for just a microsecond enough to like get out of the room and like do what you need to do. On the other hand, sweating is this thing where like we have zero control over it, right? Without like, like unexpectedly, suddenly millions of holes in our skin have opened up and liquid is coming out. Like that is objectively a weird thing, right? And so the other thing is that um, although sweat glands mostly open up because of temperature signals. So when your body gets too hot, there are other signals. So um, stress signals cause them to open up, probably because in the height of evolution, you know, if you're stressed, it usually means you have to run away from the tiger. And so you're probably going to need to start the cool down strategy pretty quickly, right? But as you know, you know, your hands start to get sweaty, your armpits get sweaty when, you know, you're you're in a an interview situation for a job or when you see your big crush, right? So there's this other like uncontrollable thing related to sweating, which is against a lot of like humanity's desire to have like, like a very curated persona, Mm. particularly now um, when we're all able to curate our personas in in social media. And then you go in real life to this party and you're like a sweaty mess. Holy crap. So I think that there's like some fundamental things about human nature. We like to be in control and this is a thing that is utterly out of our control. Um, And then I think it's exacerbated by social media media's um perfect curation yeah i i think that that's certainly how i feel when i show up to those parties and i'm dripping sweat is that you and me both (laughs) yeah yeah and is it reasonable to say that you know given the epi potential epigenetic um phenomenon that we spoke about earlier that you know typically uh you know maybe people on average who are from northwestern europe 
of ancestry are generally more likely to be super sweaters like I probably am when placed in a warm or humid environment than, for example, people who are from, you know, from Japan, from Tokyo, from Tokyo or from this near the uh, Sahara Desert, for example. Is there anything to that, that one's uh, propensity for sweat, one's likelihood of being a real sweater is is typically related to your general genetic history as well? Yeah, but I think with the whole like geographic question that you were alluding to, you also have to think about um, the issue of climate and like whether it is a human and humid environment mm. or an arid environment. So you moved from uh, Texas, correct? Austin, right? Yeah. Austin, yeah. So that is a place which is enormously dry, right? So if you're not wearing, you know, standard desert gear, which keeps some of the like hydration near you, every time you evaporate, every time you sweat, it's not just evaporating the heat off your body and achieving the goal of cooling you down, but there is like so little water in the air that it whisks away really fast. And so it's actually a lot easier to cool down by sweating that way. And so you're prone to like sweat a lot and not even notice it because mm. it's so arid that like it's easy for it to, to whisk away. Whereas mm. in humid environments, um, if you can imagine that you've got like 80% humidity and you've got a sweaty person who's trying to cool down by evaporating that sweat off um, their face or their body, there is a back pressure, right? Because there's already a lot of water molecules in the air. And so it's harder um, to evaporate and to cool down by sweating. And so there's this other variable that kind of um, makes it tricky. So you can't just make universal rules about latitude and longitude, right? Because you also have to consider like the level of humidity. And that's why people talk about this thing called wet bulb temperature. It's connected mm. to the point at which you can it's so humid and so hot that you stop being able to evaporate your heat away. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And that being said, do we know anything about the uh, various ethnicities that are prone, generally speaking, to being super sweaters, whereas others are um, maybe in their evolutionary history have developed um, a, not as much of a need to be sweating so frequently? Or is that not necessarily. No, there's that's, not that's been clear. much uh, on like racial differences and in, in sweating, and I think that's because like depending on where you are, it you know it's it it's adjusted. I mean, even you know, yeah, that's not yeah. been something that what what is genetic and interesting is uh, connected to the other part of sweating, which we haven't talked about, which is the stink, mm. um, because we have two kinds of sweat glands. And most of the time, um, we're either uh, mortified and anxious by the fact that we're like literally dripping wet or because we're stinky. But what's really interesting is that the liquid that comes out of your body to cool you down, like the majority of, of your sweat glands, that sweat isn't particularly smelly um, unless you've had a hard night of hummus or, or alcohol. And that's because it's uh, in your your blood system, your 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 body's trying to like uh, deal with that, and so when you're collecting water from your blood to move out, you know if you've had a hard night of hummus or or a hard night of drinking, you you smell like those sorts of things. But that's not the bo that we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in teenage years, you get. Um, uh, an activation of a second kind of sweat gland. And it's the difference between what's called an eccrine sweat gland and an ap apocrine sweat gland. Eccrine is the one that's like the salty liquid that's just um, kind of filtered blood. Uh, mm. Whereas apocrine glands grow anywhere where you grow hair at puberty. And that sweat is not uh, liquidy at all. It's more like earwax. And when that comes out, it also doesn't have much of an odor, but the bacteria living in your armpits, right? We coexist with bacteria everywhere on our skin, in our intestines. Um, well, it turns out that the bacteria living in your armpits really like that waxy sweat. And when 
it comes out, they eat it, and they metabolize it into stinky odors that give humans their kind of like signature smell. And so it's kind of a funny thing that this thing that is a little bit mortifying and which has spawned an $80 billion deodorant and antiperspirant industry is, you know, actually, you know, at fault. It, it's microbes that are at fault, not, not actually humans. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's that side too. I mean, I've, I've heard you in other interviews talk about the, the role of historically the advertising industry in uh, specifically, I think to America of persuading Americans to be, I think initially it was women and then uh, pivoted over to men uh, to be interested in uh, concealing some of these odors or making, making oneself smell significantly better. And I, I would love to give you an opportunity. To, you, you're welcome to speak to that in any detail you would like, but I'm also curious about, it, it's no mystery to anyone who has lived in a cosmopolitan city that it's clear that different cultures have different views on body odor in general. Um, and we clearly are uh, deodorant obsessed and antiperspirant obsessed in America, but I'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about that phenomenon as well and as any in as much detail as you would like to too. Yeah. Um what I'm looking for uh right now is I have this like amazing quote should have gotten it ahead of time. Yeah, there we are. Okay. So you were just asking me um about like human history and how we um you know, how humans connect with our body odor. And certainly um, for most of human history, we have relied on two things, um, either perfume to control our body odor, uh, or we've used soap and water. But um, we have worried about the way that we smell for a very long time. I love using this as, as an example. Um, back in the Roman era, there was a poet named Catullus, and he had a buddy named Rufus. And this is a letter um, from Catullus to Rufus. It says, Wonder not, Rufus, why none of the opposite sex wishes to place her dainty thighs beneath you, not even if you undermine her virtue with gifts of choice silk or the enticement of a pellucid gem. You are being hurt by an ugly rumor which asserts that beneath your armpits dwells a ferocious goat. This they fear, and no wonder, for it's a right rank beast that no pretty girl will go to bed with. So, either get rid of this painful affront to the nostrils, or cease to wonder why the ladies flee. So, like, we have been worried about our BO for some time, right? Um, but yeah, most of human history, we were just like slathering on a ton of perfume, or we were washing, or we weren't doing either, which was like the Middle Ages when we were worried that the plague um, was transmitted by washing. But this, you know, was pretty much humanity until about the turn of the 20th century, when um, people started to, uh, well, in the late 1800s, people discovered um, antiseptics. And as you can imagine, uh, if bacteria are eating your armpit sweat and turning it into stinky odors, if you kill them with antiseptics, then you're effectively going to stop that odor production. Yeah. And so most deodorants are just antiseptics for your armpits with a little perfume added. Hmm. And most antiperspirants actually do two things. It solves both the smell problem and the wetness problem. Hmm. And the way that that works is you use some aluminum-based product, and it's only aluminum that works, and they plug your pores, effectively cutting off the food buffet to those bacteria that would eat your sweat and then, you know, make stinky odors as a consequence. And it was at the dawn of the 20th century that these sorts of products were being introduced. But because it was also the Victorian era, at least in you know our part of the world, people were so mortified by discussion of armpits writ large or any bodily fluids that nobody wanted to buy these products. It was too embarrassing to talk about. And it was really hard to get them sold mm -hmm. until... Um, this very famous uh, 
J. Walter Thompson copywriter. His name was James Young. And he was working with um, a company that sold an antiperspirant called Odor Oh No. Um, and it was uh, a product that had been invented from a surgeon who was from Cincinnati and he was worried that his hands were too sweaty in the operating room mm. and that if he was operating in the middle of summer, that like something bad could happen. Maybe he'd like drop the knife or it would slip. And so he had invented this thing that stopped his hands from sweating. Meanwhile, his teenage daughter was like, great for your hands. What about for your pits? And launched this, this, this company called Odor Ono that had very poor success. It was like not doing well at all until um, this guy uh, came up with this idea that we shouldn't be advertising uh, antiperspirants and deodorants as a cure for stink, right? Because most people didn't think they had a problem mm -hmm. because they'd been washing and using perfume for time immortal. Instead, they said, oh, yeah, you can do those things that stop your stink, but is it really working? Actually, it's not. Worse than that, your armpit smell, your body odor is interfering with you finding love. And in initially, they like focused on women trying to find a man. And they had like taglines like, Be beautiful but dumb. She has never learned um, the lasting rule of, of you know, getting a date and a man. And so effectively, this was called whisper copy. And the idea was to put the fear of stink in women so that they worried that they were going to be socially isolated and excluded from finding a husband. This was like, mm. you know, the early 20th century. Mm. Um, and it worked. Uh, it was like super offensive, but people were, you know, worried about being talked about behind their backs and worried about not finding love. And once they saturated the market for women, they thought, oh, there's like half of the population we've ignored. What are they worried about? And around this time, it was like the late 30s, early 40s, which was when there was um, obviously the Great Depression and a lot of um, people out of work. And so the strategy that they used on men was less a, you're not going to find yourself a woman, but you're not going to find yourself a job. You're going to go into the boardroom and you're going to be stinking like a goat and you're going to lose your job. And so... They, yeah, this this is why most people in North America use like deodorants and, and antiperspirants because of this, like the success of this strategy called whisper copy. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's the fear of exclusion. We're such social animals. Um, that being said, uh, different places have different um, concerns about this. So, you know, I spent 12 years living in Germany and, you know, not everybody wears deodorants on the subway there. Um, you travel to France and, you know, people pair their deodorant perfume with their body odor, with this idea mm. that it's, it's gonna, there's gonna be an armpit malfunction. So you might as well kind of like try and come up with something that smells good together and contrast that with like North America, where any sign mm. that you smell like a human is met with like horror and disgust. And what's so funny to me and Sure, I wear deodorant too, right? Like I, I, I'm a social creature. But what cracks me up is that you know you you put on deodorants and they smell like you know citrus or they smell like spice, and it's like you're not fooling anybody. You do not smell like a citrus fruit. You do not smell like Old Spice. You, this is like not you. You're like an imposter. Mm. Um, and yet we all kind of pretend to be these, these uh, have, have these other odors, even though, um, quite frankly, we all smell pretty similar. Like humans have uh, two chemicals that are top notes in our body odor. So for example, if um, you go into an elevator, I don't know if you've ever had this experience and uh you smell a stinky smell. You can tell if it was a stinky 
dog that was in there, like a wet dog or a human or a stinky something else. But you can tell that there was a human, even though we kind of all have our own symphony of smell, there's always these two top notes. And one is, um, yeah, hexanoic acid. It's a derivative of that. And another one is uh, something called, um, I think I have it written down, sulfonyl hexanol. And one is like, smells like a tropical fruit meets like onion Hmm. and the other one smells like a rancid goat and those are the two things that like all humans make um that allows you to like distinguish human from horse or human from dog Hmm. fascinating i know i mentioned this to you before we started recording but i i have wanted to do an episode on sweating for a long time and in the one of the ironies of my life one of the best things that i do for myself which i told you told you before we started recording as well is I intentionally put myself in high heat, either sauna or heated yoga classes basically every day of my life. And there it is less embarrassing to be dumping. So it's still not a great look, but typically those classes are a little bit darker and other men, if they're in there, are typically sweating at least somewhat in the same range as I am. Um, The benefits just psychologically from that sort of heat exposure Uh, I think outside of sleeping eight or nine hours a night is the best thing I do for my health. And it's not even close. Um, I'd love to give you an opportunity too to speak to what we know about why sweating. And obviously people do this in other contexts, running or working out. But for me, it it seems to really get it. I get a ton of benefit from, you know, a hundred degree rooms and 40% humidity for an hour pushing myself pretty hard and the endorphin rush or just the improvement in mood and cognitive ability, um, pro sociality afterwards is it's like two different humans. It's like, I have run the experiment on a day without it and a day with it. And it's like, I'm two different people. Um, I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak to the health benefits, um, of a really great sweat in however much detail you might like to provide. Yeah, sure. Um, that euphoria is, is real. Mm, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I will start off by saying that a lot of like spa and yoga places make all sorts of claims about the health benefits of sweating in large quantities. And there are, as you point out, many, hmm. but there's a lot of like BS too, right? Like sweating in large quantities is not going to cure cancer. It's not going to cure the common cold. None of these studies have ever been more than like one tiny study that had like dodgy results. Hmm. What we do know though, is that sweating regularly, even just in a sauna or like in a yoga space um, is really, really good for heart health. Hmm. Um, And I'll explain why. So Um, This is actually a really long range study that was done in Finland, where they have more saunas than cars, um, Mm. and almost like one sauna per person. Anyway, um, they looked at like thousands and thousands of people over a very long time and found that people who went to the sauna more often had lower incidences of cardiovascular disease um, and other health disease, lower incidence of heart attacks. So effectively, going and regularly sweating in a sauna is actually really good for your health. And the way that it was explained to me by um, the scientist who, who did that work is that effectively, when you go into a sauna, even though you're not exercising, you are getting some of the benefits of exercise. Mm-hmm. So if you think about what I was talking about before, where um, if you like start to run, your body starts the cool down process, right? And what is happening when you go into a sauna is exactly the same thing, right? So even though you are not burning calories when you're just sitting in a sauna, um, you are exercising your heart because it's got to move all the blood from your hot interior around to um, the Mm. surface of your skin to cool away 
um, mm. to cool your body down. And so it's really pumping fast, right? Like you go into a sauna and your heart starts beating fast, even though you're just sitting there. And so it's a great workout for your heart and you get the benefits, um, both hormonal. So you mentioned like endorphins, right? Endorphins and epinephrine and other happy hormones are produced when your heart gets a workout, right? That's what runners experience and other, you know, spin people who do spin, but that workout, even just sitting in a sauna for your heart is doing the same thing. And so you get the happy hormones and then you also get um, a workout for your heart, which is good for you just writ large and good for your cardiovascular life. And so that is the, um, the science that's very solid on why it is good just to sit in a sauna or to sit in a really hot place and to do some exercise. Of course, I think in your case, if you're doing a little bit of yoga, you're also like beautifully stretching, you're probably doing a little bit of exercise and getting some other knock on effects, but just sitting in a sauna, even though it's not, um, burning as many calories as maybe doing jump squats or, or going mm -hmm. for a run, you're still exercising your heart. But um, I would like to say that like one of the biggest myths that these places say is the detox myth that like mm. sweating in large quantities is going to help rid your body of nasty chemicals. And this is complete hogwash if you understand how the human body works. So hmm. if you remember, um, when you get the cool down directive and start to sweat, your sweat glands are sourcing that liquid from your blood, right? So that means anything that's circulating around in your blood does come out in your sweat. So that means good stuff comes out like vitamins or hormones or a little bit of that alcohol that you took too much of the night before. Um, also things like lactic acid, also bad things like um, urea or, you know, if you have heavy metals in your blood, anything that's circulating in your blood that is smaller than a red blood cell, that's just like a molecule, that's going to come out. Um, but that's not how you rid your body of that bad stuff. Because if you think about it, to get all that bad stuff out, you would literally have to sweat out all the liquid in your blood. That would leave you hmm. completely dehydrated and most likely dead. Yeah. Instead, right, you have kidneys that filter your blood for that crap and send out that crap in pee. Anything that comes out in your sweat it is a sign of what's happening in your blood, right? It's a sign of what's happening inside, but it's not how you are getting that stuff out. It's not how you're like ex like getting rid of it or purging your body. It's just coming out incidentally. Hmm. But it's also kind of interesting from a surveillance side because of course, you know, when you drip you know, a little bit of sweat on your yoga mat, you're not just revealing that you're a sweaty dude and doing some exercise. But if you were doing drugs or if, you know, all sorts of other information, if it's circulating around in your blood, that's going to come out in your sweat as well. So um, scientists are actually, and, and particularly forensic scientists, are looking at ways to learn about um, people at crime scenes from the sweat they leave behind, mm. which is typically in fingerprints, because like a fingerprint is just a sweat print. Mm. And up until now, most forensic scientists have looked at those prints and how they look and compared them to databases of known criminals. But if there's, if you're not a known criminal, but you commit a crime, um, you're not in that database. But now they can lift a fingerprint and instead of just looking at how the whirls and swirls appear, you know, kind of artistically, they can actually measure the chemistry of the leftover sweat you left mm. behind and find out if you're, you know, high on cocaine, um, if you're a meat eater or vegan mm. um, or, you know, anything like that. So I, I had my fingerprints tested and um, they could tell that I had a coffee because there was caffeine left over in my fingerprint. And had I spiked my coffee with a little bit of um, uh, whiskey, Bailey's. as I am known to do, <laughs> yeah, uh, that would have come out too. And and already law enforcement is um, doing kind of proof of principle tests. Like they uh, 
lifted a, a fingerprint from um, a windowsill where a stalker had tried to break into a woman's house and found out that the guy, just from one fingerprint, had been drinking and high on cocaine. Mm. So, you know, this is both really interesting. Um, it's interesting for athletes because you can learn um, from your sweat if you are exercising aerobically or anaerobically because different levels of lactic acid are produced. So if you're like training for a marathon versus a sprint, right, mm -hmm. you might want to adjust your, your exercise using like a device attached to your finger. On the other hand, um, you can also learn if, you know, you have cancer or you can learn if you're doing drugs. And what if in your workplace, somebody lifts this from your cubicle and finds out that you, you know, come to work high. So there's like all sorts of interesting privacy and surveillance things that are coming out from just the fact that sweat um, is sourced from the liquidy parts of your blood. Fascinating. And so it's obviously not a blood draw, but some of the data that one can get from a blood draw seemingly can also be obtained through sweat analysis. Yeah. So that's what people are hoping for, because of course, a blood draw is like traumatic for some and it also like requires a needle. Um, and so people are really interested to find out different sorts of things like can you diagnose some diseases this way? Can you, um, yeah, like could you, I mean, the holy grail um, is, is blood glucose levels because like folks who have diabetes have to have um, a small needle in their arm completely always measuring their glucose level. This is really tricky because we have bacteria on our skin. And so um, as soon as the glucose comes out, the bacteria eat it. And so it's very hard to like really measure glucose accurately. But in terms of things like the next time, you know, in 10 years, you go to a pub and your uh, smartwatch is in contact with your skin. And after five beers, you get a push alert saying, dude, yeah. take a take a cab home or an Uber or whatever we're using then. Um, or uh, you have a car that has a fingerprint starter and the insurance company requires that that fingerprint shows no signs of alcohol for you to be able to start the car. Or you can imagine, you know, long distance truck drivers or pilots um, get tested just before they get into um, the cockpit uh, to, to test them for their state of affairs. Or last but not least, um, sports teams. So you can imagine um, if you have like a, a soccer match or a football match or whatever, a, a basketball, and, and somebody has like a sweat patch that's measuring um, what's coming out in their sweat. Well, when you start making stress hormones, that usually indicates that your performance is probably going to start to plummet because you're like you're you're at your max. So if you're a coach on the sidelines with an iPad and you are monitoring the biochemical signals in the sweat of all your players, you can be like, yeah, let's pull that person out and put this new fresh uh, player in. Hmm. Fascinating. I know we're getting close to the end of the conversation, and I want to I want to close by. Um, doubling down on some of the potential health benefits of, of sweating. And, you know, you were just talking about stress hormones and cortisol. And it has always been my intuition that part of what I'm doing when I'm doing these daily exercises is releasing cortisol or that there's something happening where my stress levels are getting massively reduced. I've often said to friends that um, that daily practice for me brings any day on a scale of one to 10 up two or three notches. And part of that is just a reduction, a massive reduction in, in stress and just uh, uh, general anxiety. Um, I know, you know, there's data that I've, I've read about related to, um, how sauna practitioners seem to have a massive reduction in all, all cause mortality, something like 40%. Uh, for people that are doing sauna practices four or five times a week. It's a long way of me asking, is it really, it's not necessarily, if I'm understanding you correctly, the sweat that is leading to those sorts of benefits. It's more the heart, um, stress, stressing the heart that's leading to largely the, um, you know, positive effects on your psychology and your, uh, your, the positive effects on your general biology i i've i've had an intuition too that i'm basically 
intentionally inducing a mild um, uh, fever every day. But I would love to t- put it to you and get your thoughts on any of any of that or all of that 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 uh, you might like to respond to. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's not there's so much to be said for forcing your heart um, to exercise, and all sorts of like other things benefit from that. So, um, and this is uh, work that's been done in animal models where they put like little hamsters into saunas, um, mm-hmm. and they look at the chemicals that are produced in their blood when when they're they're forced to to heat up, and that exercising of your heart, right? It's not just giving you the happy hormones, like do not underestimate the power of a happy hormone, right? Like we produce things that give us euphoria. Think of like the joy that you have see when you see somebody that you love or a beautiful landscape, like you literally feel a joy and that is chemistry. That's like your body producing happy hormones. Um, And so don't underestimate um, the power of like the production of those happy hormones and your body wants you to continue doing things that are good for your body, right? Mm. So like exercising your heart is good for your body. It leads to a longer life. And so your body wants to give you a little perk on the side. It's like, good boy, like here, right? So like you are getting benefits because your body knows that this is good for your heart. And also there's, um, the production of enzymes that like, for example, uh, break down plaque um, in, in, in your circulatory system, that's got like overall like benefits for reducing, you know, the chances of things like stroke and, and other, right. Like you've got to like imagine that like benefit it, like working out your heart has tons and tons of downstream effects and your body wants you to keep doing that um, so that you can live a long, healthy life. So I think that that's what it's about. Um, And I think we are really good at thermal regulation. Like that is our, our amazing skill set. It has benefited humans for, you know, as long as we've been um, hairless apes. Right. And so, you know, it behooves us to, yeah, to, to lean into that. Love it. Uh, I love your work. I love this subject. I really appreciate you taking time to uh, talk to me and, and my audience about uh, this subject. It was really wonderful to talk to you. It was really a pleasure.